Good morning. I'm happy to be here today to share this message from Romans. We're actually going to cover 11 verses today. What time do you think? We'll just go right through until it's 5 o'clock. No, we got 11 verses to cover, but this is a really neat section of Scripture. And I wanted to share with you guys, you know, I really liked what Kathy said about how we need to be remembering that God is with us and speaking to us and working in the circumstances of our life throughout the week, right? And I want you to know too, as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it better not only be what I'm studying to preach that God is using in my life. It better be that I have my own personal time in God's word, and I do. And I was seeking him, I don't know, it, it seems like it was a week ago. It might not quite have been a week ago. And I was seeking him regarding some things going on and wisdom I need and just a number of things that my family is facing and different issues. And the Lord led me to Psalm 119. How many of you know that's a very long psalm? And it's a psalm about the word of God. But the verse that he caused my eyes to be directed to were verses 23 and 24. And before I share this with you, I want to tell you, how many of you know from studying the book of Daniel ever in the past or from knowing Ephesians chapter 6 that when the Bible speaks of a prince or a principality, a prince could be a literal ruler on the earth, right? Or a prince could also refer to a demonic hierarchy. Do you guys know that? So I'm reading the scripture and, you know, we go through a lot of spiritual attacks. How many of you know the enemy is always trying to take you out? And he's always trying to discourage you. So I was reading, and I came to verse 23, and here is what the scripture says. Though princes sit together and speak against me, your servant will trust in your statutes. Your decrees are my delight and my counselors. That was a beautiful scripture to me. Because I could picture what the Lord laid in my heart is, Shelley, there are spiritual powers trying to take each of us down. How many of you know that? There are. And those princes are principalities. They're demons. And they work through all kinds of circumstances. This scripture God gave to me a week ago, and I have been clinging to it. Here's what it says again. Now, with that in mind, remember, here's what Psalm 119, 23 and 24 says. Though princes sit together speaking against me. Like, though demons are plotting against your very life, is how I take that to mean. Your decrees, your word, is my delight, and your words are my counselors. Who is thankful for that this morning? God's got everything under control. And so I like what Kathy said. We need to remember that on a daily basis. Everybody does. Even people who preach the word of God. Like, I've got to have God speaking to me personally. There's something he gives to me to give to you, and then there's things that he gives to me to give to me. Just like you all should have not just what you're hearing when it's spoken or preached or taught to you, but you need to be digging in and hearing from the Lord as well. Amen? Just felt that I wanted to share that with everyone. Okay, this morning, how's your conscience? We'll get to that. All right, here's the deal. In two weeks, I will be having the baptism basics class via Zoom. Two weeks. So if you're listening online, if you're here and you're still feeling that little pressing in your spirit that says, maybe I'm supposed to get baptized, you need to reach out to Hope and Passion Ministries or to Donegal Alliance Church. You need to do that soon because we want to get you on that Zoom meeting. I'm only going to speak for about 45 minutes. I'm going to share with everybody who wants to be baptized what baptism is. I want to make sure that you understand that. And uh, then we'll all pray together, and God is going to do great things. Amen? He's going to do wonderful, wonderful things, because God blesses obedience. Amen? God blesses obedience. Baptism is not salvation, but it is walking in obedience publicly to what the Lord has told us to do. And so God will bless you for that. So reach out if you're interested. Thank you to all of our givers, open passion givers. Can't say enough. 
Uh, I'm so thankful that God uses the internet. God uses social media. God uses Venmo. Every once in a while, I'll be sitting somewhere and I'll hear a certain tone go off on my phone and I know what that tone is. The Lord's just dropped it on somebody's heart to give to Hope and Passion Ministries so we can keep preaching the gospel. And that's a blessing to us. So I thank you to all of our givers, whether you give on Venmo, whether you write cards and send checks in the mail, or you get on the website, hopeandpassion.org. By the way, hopeandpassion.org is where you can access written devotions. It's where you can see our calendar of everything that's coming up. It's where you can give. It's where you can just hit the contact us button and get in touch with us for anything, any reason, including baptism. And we are grateful for each and every one of you. All right, got your Bibles? We're going to go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Now, like I said, we're doing 11 verses today. This is like, we should win a spiritual Olympic medal today. We're covering so many verses. Okay, Romans 2, 6 through 16. Now, you're going to recognize verse 6 and uh, verse 7 and probably verse 8 because we're going to do a little overlap. How many of you remember our last Romans message was on this. Are we judged by our works or not? Do you guys remember that? You guys remember the infinitely deep righteousness hole that only God can fill? Do you guys now understand why unbelievers will be judged for rejecting Jesus who fills the righteousness hole, right? But we believers will be judged, won't we? For what? For not building on the foundation that Jesus has given us, amen? So this is important. That's, what we, that's where we were when we met last time in Romans. So a little bit of overlap with those scriptures going into more detail. Beginning at verse 6 and reading through verse 16. God will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires... They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 2. How many of you agree? This is a lot to think about. And we're going to talk about conscience. We're going to talk about people who have the law, people who don't have the law, why both are equally judged, right? Impartially. And I want to be very, very sure that those who are watching this live stream or this YouTube recording who have not seen the previous message, The very first phrase of verse 6, he will render to each one according to his works. I want to make sure, disclaimer, that you go back to our previous Romans message titled, Does God Judge Our Works or Not? And listen to that so that you're not mistaken about salvation by works. Okay, because I clearly explained that. We all have gone over that already, so we're going to move forward. The Bible says God will render to each one according to his works to those who, now check this out, this is a very uplifting statement, a very encouraging statement. 
To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. How many of you would like to be known for that? That every day of your life you are seeking for glory, for honor, and for immortality. There's something about that phrase that really gets me going and I love it. All right? Bible says, for those who by patience in well-doing seek for those things, God will give you what? Eternal life. It is true that Jesus died for our sins that we might have eternal life. That's the basics. That's the core of the gospel. But as you continue to study the Bible, you read that there's depth to these things. Amen? That when Jesus saves you, he makes you a person who by patience and well-doing seeks for glory and honor and immortality. And if you want to say, yes, I called upon Jesus as Savior at one point in my life, and yet you don't do these things, you might want to ask yourself the question, did I really call upon Jesus as Savior? You see what I'm saying? There's depth to all of this. I put a graphic up here for you to see this easily. Patience in well-doing leads to other things. But the word patience there, as it's translated in your Bible, the original Greek behind the word patience is perseverance. How many of you think perseverance is a little bit more strong of a word than patience? I think sometimes we read patience and we're like, oh yeah, I, I have patience generally. Sometimes I lose my patience. That's not really the gist of this word. This word patience in the Greek means perseverance. And I want you to think about the word perseverance. First of all, as it is rendered in the Bible, it has to do with steadfastness, constancy, and endurance. How many of you know it's really a big deal to stay constant with God? This word, uh, this, this word endurance, as we think about it, endurance means to hold up under something. It means the pressure's coming down on you, but you're still pressing upward. Anybody ever feel like you're having to do that? Okay, so this is a very serious word. It is spoken of a man or woman who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and holiness by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Do you want to be a person like that? That even when the greatest trials and sufferings come pressing in on you, you're never swerved from your loyalty to Jesus Christ. How many of you know Christians that seem like they're Christians and then all of a sudden they're off the rails? No, we want to be people who persevere. We want to keep Christ at the center. Now, I told you, I think not too long ago, did I tell you guys that I, I had four years of Latin in high school and I hardly remember anything? Okay. But this is where it comes in handy. The word perseverance in English, Latin roots behind it are per and severe. Per means through. Okay? Severe, we all know what that means, right? So the word persevere means to stick to it through severe days, severe events, severe trials. Isn't that a blessing? This perseverance in well-doing combined with seeking glory, honor, and immortality leads to eternal life. On the other hand, there are a group of people, and there are only two groups of people named here. You're either in category one or in category two. On the other hand, there are those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. So let's, let's look at that. Because it's very important to know that those people have coming to them what? Wrath and fury. Now, when I lose my temper, it can be a very ugly, sinful scene. Okay? How many of you can lose your temper pretty good? Your wrath is not something pretty, right? But can you imagine the wrath of God? This category of people will face God's wrath and fury. So I want you to look at the difference. Patience in well-doing versus self-seeking and refusing truth. How many of you know the opposite of 
per- pers- persevering in doing things well and doing things right for God's sake is the opposite of self-seeking. How many of you have had to put yourself on the back burner a million times this past week? That's right. Daily. Me too. There are some days I think, God, do I have the strength to put myself on the back burner anymore? Like, but how many of you know God will give it to you? Okay, do you see how that's opposite? The unsaved are self-seeking. They refuse the truth. The saved are self-sacrificing for Jesus' sake and what he desires. The unsaved obey unrighteousness. Can you imagine? We obey Christ and they obey what is not right. Don't you see that in America today? It's like, what do you follow? Anything that's unrighteous, that's, that's what I obey. That's what I feel like the world is like today. They will endure what? Wrath and fury. Here's what I want you, look at that graphic again. Selflessness and persevering under lots of pressure for Jesus' sake leads to eternal life, immortality, glory and honor. But when you're all about yourself, it leads to wrath and fury. What struck me is how for serving Christ, we get glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. That's a huge thing, isn't it? Wrath and fury, that's a very focused, terrible thing. And what I thought when I was reading that, what the Lord laid on my heart is, I said it to myself, Shelly, do you see how the hell-bound life tends to close in on itself? I want you to think about that for a minute. Selfish people, hell-bound people, become very small people, don't they? Whereas the righteous, the giving, the ones who are doing everything for God's glory, have great, wide impact. Isn't that true? And that will flesh itself out when you die. It is self-seeking and pushes away truth and righteousness, the hell-bound life. Watch this. A hell-bound person is self-seeking. Their life pushes away truth and righteousness, whereas the life that perseveres in pleasing God is seeking something bigger, more expansive, glory and immortality. Selfishness closes in on itself. Righteousness opens you wide open. Now, I knew when I was reading that, I knew I had read C.S. Lewis speak of this somewhere, and I think this is in his book, The Great Divorce, a book that he wrote about hell. I love this quote. Now, it's an allegory, okay? But here's what it says. Listen, all hell is smaller than one pebble of your earthly world. Now, before we finish this, I want you to know, he's not necessarily talking about actual geography. What he's trying to say is the effects of hell. What hell ends up being? All hell is smaller than one pebble of your earthly world. But it is smaller than one atom of this world, the real world. Now, the real world, world there is a synonym for heaven. That's what he's speaking of, heaven. So he says, compared to the earth we have now, hell is smaller than a pebble. Compared to heaven, hell is smaller than even one atom of heaven. Look at yon butterfly. If it swallowed all hell, hell would not be big enough to do it any harm or to have any taste. How many of you know that when you get to heaven, you'll be aware that there is a hell? You will know that God is just and righteous. I've talked about this before. We don't forget that there's a hell when we get to heaven. But our swallowing of the reality of hell will not harm us in any way. Praise God. Because eternal life is so big, God's glory is so grand, that all of the selfishness and sin of hell is nothing compared to it. Isn't that something amazing to think about? Randy Alcorn wrote a wonderful book on heaven. Here's what he said. If we think correctly about heaven, we will realize that because God is infinitely great and gracious, heaven is the ultimate adventure, while hell is the ultimate what? Sinkhole. So here's my suggestion to everybody listening. 
I want you to picture your life this week, and I want you to make sure that you are not living in a self-seeking way because selfishness begins to close in on itself. And selfishness will ultimately lead to the greatest closing in that there is, to the greatest darkness and nothingness that there is, and that is what? Hell. That will be the worst. Whereas heaven leads to what is completely expansive and huge. These verses say that by patience we must seek for glory and honor and what? Immortality. The word immortality there means incorruption, perpetuity. How many of you in this place are seeking to live forever? Amen? How many of you love to know that as your body wears down and as your body wears out, you're going to live forever. There's a world beyond this one. That's immortality. That's perpetuity. Not only is it perpetuity, but it's incorruption. Not only are we going to live forever, we're going to live forever in bodies that can never sin, bodies that can never be sick, bodies that can never get disgusted. I just thought of that one. I never thought of that. Heaven is a place where you'll never be disgusted. I feel like I'm disgusted on a quite regular basis, so I can't wait for that, right? Okay, but isn't that incredible? We can be seeking for that every single day. It's an active pursuit. To those who seek that, God is going to give eternal life. And of course, only God can give eternal life, right? Nobody else can. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. Amen? Only God has immortality. Now, the Bible says, this is scary, so listen in. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. I hope somebody's listening today that has never heard that before. Don't you? I pray, I was listening to a, a Charles Spurgeon sermon this morning, and I, he was talking about how he prays that those who are lost in sin would be miserable and be at complete unrest. Do you pray that for your loved ones? Be miserable and be at complete unrest. So that you will not be settled in your sinfulness. This is a strong scripture. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. That's a promise from God. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Now, the Bible knowledge commentary reminds us a person's habitual conduct, whether good or evil, reveals the condition of his heart. Eternal life is not rewarded for good living. That would contradict many other scriptures, which clearly state that salvation is not by works, but it is all of God's grace to those who believe. Hallelujah. We know that. A person's doing good shows that his heart has been regenerated. It shows that he has been made new or born again, as Jesus said. Such a person redeemed by God has eternal life. Conversely, a person who continually does evil and rejects the truth shows that he is unregenerate and therefore will be an object of God's wrath. Okay? This is the way it is. It is true that like King David, a good, righteous, saved person can fall into sin, but they will hate that they did it and they will quickly come out of it. Amen? And the general tenor of their life will be to seek after God and do good for God. We must remember who we are in real time and space reveals who we are inside. You can't get away from that fact, can you? All right. Interestingly, two times Paul here says, this happens first for the Jew, but also for the Greek. But notice how it always says the Jews first and then the Gentiles. Do you ever 
Think about that. Now, we've talked about this before in other messages, but I want to reiterate it. Because Paul is the missionary to the Gentiles. So he wants to make sure he's giving, you know, he's putting things in proper order. God deals with the Jews first and then the Gentiles. How many of you know that's true? He did in the Old Testament. He gave his promises to the Jews. He brought his Savior through the Jewish nation, right? Then he reached out to the Gentiles after the Jews rejected him. So we know how this goes. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the who first? To the Jew first and then also to the Greeks. So you know how the world is so anti-Semitic today? God is not anti-Semitic. He's actually, they're my people, I'm dealing with them first kind of God. Amen? But on the other hand, he shows no partiality. I, as a Gentile, mean no less to God than the Jews mean to God. But he has, I just thought of something as a former math teacher, God has an order of operations. <laughs> right? Okay, you got to do what's in the parentheses first, right? Okay. There's an order of operations. And God's order of operation is, I'm going to deal with the Jews first, and then I'll deal with the Gentiles. And he carries it through even in judgment and in blessing, right? We've learned that, haven't we? Even when it comes to end times, God's going to deal with the Jews in the tribulation. Okay. Meyer's New Testament commentary. The Jews, as the people of God, in possession of the revelation, that's the Bible, with its promises and threatenings, are therefore necessarily also those upon whom the retribution of judgment, not just the reward, but also the punishment, has to find in the first instance its execution. Okay? Since the Jews were the first to get the truth, they were the first to reject the truth. They are the first to be dealt with, right? We also are dealt with. We are just secondary. Why is Paul saying all this? To remind all of us that God shows no what? Partiality. We live in a world that is favorable in many ways to those who are wealthy, to those who are powerful. How many of you know that's true? And God's law, especially the Old Testament, said... And he even said it to pastors. I mean, God said it to everyone. He said, you, be very careful. You should not show partiality in your systems of law. Don't slight somebody because you say, oh, well, they're poor. They're just a nobody. God says, be very careful about that because I will judge that. God wants no partiality, not because somebody's rich, not because somebody's poor. We're not to favor people who are beautiful versus people who are outward, outwardly seem not to be beautiful. Is anybody with me? We are not to favor those who have high IQs over those who don't. We're not to favor people in greater social status or because of their talent. God shows no partiality. And so, what about us? We should show no partiality. That's a very important biblical principle. Deuteronomy 10, 17, the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. Don't show favor to people who can do things for you as opposed to people who can't. Amen? Be blind to all that. And do right by everybody. J. Vernon McGee, God plays no favorites. He has no pets. All men are alike before him. Justice is blindfolded. Not because she is blind, but that she may not see men in either silk or rags. All must appear before God alike. Aren't you thankful for that today? God strips it down to the bare minimum of you are a human being and I gave you access to the truth and that's how your judgment will fall. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. He'll deal with you at any intellectual level you have. He can get into the spirit, not the mind only, right? Church membership, a good family, being an outstanding citizen, having a fundamental creed, give no advantage before God at all. Do you have a savior or don't you? That's the all-important issue. That's what it all comes down to. 
God shows no partiality. Now, watch this. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. What in the world does this mean? I'm going to use one of my graphics just to get this in our heads, okay? So the Bible is saying here that it is possible to sin and to die. Now, listen to me on this. It is possible to sin and to die. And the reason this is so important is I have had ever since, uh, you know, things went viral on TikTok for me, I've had so many people reach out to me and say, but how is God just if people who have never had a Bible, people who have never heard of Jesus, if they go to hell, how can God be a good God? I mean, I've dealt with that many times in my speaking, but this kind of goes back to that. Listen, Romans is telling us that it is possible to sin and to die for that sin completely apart from the law. In other words, you never had access to God's commandments. But you sinned, and you will still die for your sin. Now, I've explained before in Romans chapter 1, go back and re-listen to those, that any heart that's honestly seeking God, God is going to answer that prayer, and you're going to find Jesus. Whether it's by direct intervention of the Holy Spirit, a page of the scriptures through a missionary, uh, whatever. God will use whatever he has to do. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible says it is possible to sin and die even though somebody never had access to the commandments of God. On the other hand, God said, it is possible to sin and face judgment when you had the law. Now that kind of makes more sense to us, right? But both are true. Did we just read it in the scriptures? All right, let's talk about it. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Now, the Bible Knowledge Commentary says, Gentiles who sin will perish. Heathens who sin will perish. But the law of Moses will not be used as a standard of judgment against them. They didn't have that standard. The Gentiles are not excused from God's judgment, but they will not be judged according to the standard that was not given to them. Does that make sense to everybody? If somebody didn't have the law... God's not going to judge them by the law, but he is going to judge them. So what God is saying is, there is something about a human being, there is something about the image of God that he has created each of us in, there is something within us that makes us responsible to seek God even if X, Y, Z. You with me? This is important to understand as a Christian. Charles Swindoll, how can someone be justly punished for breaking rules he or she knows nothing about? But that's Paul's point entirely. Gentiles living in places far removed from the promised land may have never known a single Hebrew or the law the Hebrews kept. But every man and woman bears the image of God. An image smudged by sin, but God's image nonetheless. Do you believe that today sitting here? Do you believe that? Online, I hope that you believe that. I hope that you know that the worst heathen that you could ever conceptualize of is still a human being who's been made in the image of God. And there's something about that having been created in the image of God that enables that person, if they desire, to find knowledge of God. That's what Romans 1 was all about. Do you remember it? No one has an excuse. Part of that image includes an innate sense that some actions are good and some actions are bad. The details may not be accurate. 
One's understanding of good may be flawed. Nevertheless, even by this imperfect standard, no one lives righteously. No one has ever perfectly obeyed his or her own conscience. How many of you could give an amen to that? Whether you ever had knowledge of the Bible or not, you cannot sit there or you cannot be on this listening to this message and say, well, even when I didn't have the Bible, I had a conscience and I always obeyed my conscience perfectly. Is there anybody who could say that? And we all know that we do have a conscience. Now we're going to talk in a minute. We can do damage to our conscience. It can be rendered incapable of something, but that's only after your own rejection of God's truth. Every human being on the face of the earth has the potential for salvation given to them by God. It is not God who sends people to hell. People refuse God's saving grace. This is important because we have churches today, denominational churches all over the place are caving in to something called universalism. Jesus died for all, so all are saved. No. Only those who are saved are those who actively and individually place trust in Christ as Savior. This is important. When Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. How many of you have ever known a person who's not real familiar with the Bible? I mean, there are people in the world who have never heard the word of God, never heard of Jesus, but I know some very upstanding people who do not follow Jesus. They're not Christians. Uh, they probably never read the Bible, but... They'll do good things for you. And, and they wouldn't kill their neighbor. They wouldn't even kill their neighbor's cat. How many of you know people like that? Okay, it's in the Bible. When Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they don't have the law. When you know inside that you are doing something that is wrong, whether you know it's articulated in the word of God or not, guess what you just did? You sinned. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their, look at this, conflicting thoughts sometimes accuse them, sometimes excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Okay, you're starting to see how God is weaving an understanding of a conscience into this right now. And I pray this is very helpful for some people who are listening. There's a lot of never thought this through deeply, but it's all in God's word. We have a conscience. Okay? God judges the secrets of men. Okay, I'll just, that could be a whole sermon on its own. I mean, I, I just look at that statement and my whole body just wants to shudder, right? Because you can fool a lot of the people a lot of the time, but you ain't fooling God. You can act all happy and loving on the outside and you can have the blot of sin and hatred and jealousy and all kind of stuff in your heart. You can look like a church attending Christian and inside you have the devil. But you ain't getting away with nothing. Now I know it's irritating when we think that that's happening. And that's when we want to take our own revenge, right? But no, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. The Bible says their conscience also bears witness. Now, first of all, the law is written on their hearts. We went through that in Romans chapter 1. 
the creation of the world, our own minds, our own bodies, nature around us, God has given everything we need for us to know that there is a God and then seek him. And he will never fail to answer the prayer, Lord, I want to know you more. Okay? But now we're talking about not just nature, not just an intellectual awareness of creation that leads us to God, but now Paul in the second chapter is saying there's something else about a human being that leads them to God, that should lead them to God. And that is the conscience. It's real. Conscience is an important part of human nature, but it is not an absolutely trustworthy indicator of what is right. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, guess what else got marred in us? Our conscience. Nothing about Shelley Prindle has ever been perfect. Nor will it be until I see Jesus. Amen? Nothing about any human being has been perfect since Adam and Eve fell. So just like people can reject the witness of God in creation, people can reject the work of the conscience and therefore twist it and pervert it. Just like people take creation, they don't want to believe there's a God because of creation, and so they twist and pervert the thoughts of evolution and, you know, all that stuff. Same thing can happen with the conscience. As a matter of fact, and I'm not going to go through all the scriptures on this, and if you're interested, I can email you this PowerPoint so you don't have to scurry to write these down, but know that this is backed by scripture. Watch this. As a matter of fact, other parts of the Bible tell us what can happen to a conscience. First of all, your conscience can be good. You can submit your conscience to God and it's good. We who are believers should generally have pretty good consciences. And when we go against God, even if we've never read that verse yet in the Bible, the Holy Spirit's probably showing us, right, through our conscience, that's wrong. Your conscience can be clear. How many of you are thankful, like, uh, you, you go through some kind of testing, you know, you're tempted to sin, you don't do it, you listen to your conscience, you listen to the Word of God, and you're like, how many of you have ever been able to say about a situation, well, that really went bad, but at least my conscience is clear? I mean, I've actually had, I, I had to exit a ministry position at one point because I was being called, I've told you guys this before, to violate my own conscience toward God by a pastor. And I ended up having to exit to leave that position, to resign from my job because my conscience was being violated by what I would potentially have to do. And I mean, it was a bad situation after I left, a bunch of fallout after I went because I was leader of this organization. But I want to tell you something. When I walked away from that, I said, well, that didn't go real well, but at least my conscience is clear. Amen? Protect your conscience. When God tells you it's wrong, don't do it. There'll be other people that you talk to who may not know Christ, and they'll say, well, my conscience isn't telling me that's wrong. Well, you've got one of these other consciences we're about to list. It can be good, it can be clear. There's only one thing that we know for sure. You always got to test your conscience against the word of God. Okay? Not what people feel, not what people say. Your conscience can be guilty, obviously. We've all been there. Your conscience, the Bible says in Timothy, can actually be corrupted. Corrupted. It can be made imperfect. It can go tilt. And why does it go tilt? Because you refuse to submit it to God is why. Your conscience can be weakened. How many of you know that if you keep not listening to your conscience, it becomes less and less functional? I guess it's kind of like, I don't know, before I came to church today, I was doing toe touches. Well, almost toe touches. It's getting pretty close, yeah. It's trying to stretch. How many of you know you got to keep your muscles working, right? Same thing with your conscience. It can grow weak. You want to ignore it? It'll get weak. Conscience can be, oh, this is one of the scariest ones. Your conscience can be seared. You know how you sear a steak? 
You can sear your conscience. I actually want to turn to this one. I wasn't going to, but I'm going to do this. First Timothy chapter 4. Listen to this. <clears throat> this is very, very foreboding and a very important warning. So 1 Timothy chapter 4. You might recognize the passage. My Bible titles this section, Some Will Depart from the Faith. Okay? And we are in it now. We're in the shadows of the great delusion. We're seeing not only people, but churches turn from God's word, departing from the faith. That's where we're at. It was prophesied in the word of God. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, now the Holy Spirit expressly says that in the later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Now, these teachings are going to be coming through human beings. Are you with me? It's, it's, you know, the, the devil's not going to come up in front of the church with horns and like goo coming out of his mouth and a pitchfork in his hand teaching people. It's going to be an upstanding person. These are human beings teaching the doctrine of demons. Okay? He says that's what's going to happen. And how are they going to do it? Look at verse 2. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Now think about that for a minute. The indication here is when we become insincere, when we become hypocrites, if you will, when we start to act a certain way on the outside, but we're really playing for the other team, we start to lie and be insincere. The Bible says you can sear, you can burn your conscience. And when you sear or burn your conscience, how many of you know? It's of no value anymore. It's got no sensitivity left. So be careful with the conscience. And this is why I tell you, we must always, no matter if a family member is speaking to us, no matter if a small group leader is speaking to us, no matter if a pastor is speaking to us, no matter if a worldwide ministry leader is speaking to us, anything you ever hear, do not act upon it until you check it against God's word. Amen? Because consciences can be guilty, corrupted, weak, and at worst, seared. And the seared conscience in the Bible is actually applied to ministry leaders who teach the doctrines of demons. Anybody know the name John Huss? John Huss was a man of God. Study about him a little bit. John Huss uh, was a man who stood up against the organized church at that time, it was the Catholic Church at that time. You know the Catholic Church at, at one point was selling indulgences, was making people pay money to have their sins forgiven. Okay, it was all kind of wicked and corrupt. Just like today, there was corruption in the church, and John Huss was standing up for God's word within the church. He was coming against what he saw was wrong, okay? He was a student of John Wycliffe. How many of you know about Wycliffe? Wycliffe Bible translators, all right? So this guy was standing up for God's truth against corrupt church leadership. And for that, he was given a great place in the church and able to go on and have massive effect in the world. <laughs> yeah, that's normally not what happens to those of us who stand up for the truth in the midst of what might be false teaching. You know what he got? He was burned at the stake. He was burned at the stake. John Phillips shares a bit of history regarding when John Huss was burned at the stake. And I want you to think about this because this is a quintessential example of how a conscience can be good and clear, and at the same time, another person's conscience regarding the exact same issue can be seared and wrong. And this is why we don't listen to one another, we listen to God's word. Amen? 
This is why I primarily in my ministry have chosen to speak the Bible in an expository fashion. There's sometimes I'll do a topical message, that's okay. But I choose to teach God's word line by line because it ensures that you understand, that I understand, that we are going from God's word, not Shelley Prindle's narrative that I tuck a few verses into. Right? That's important. Listen to this example, terrible example. It is said that when John Huss was burned at the stake, a poor widow came along bearing a bundle of wood. She requested the officials to put the bundle on the pile as close as possible to the martyr. She was a stranger to John Huss. So he asked the woman, what he had ever done to her or hers that she should hate him so much. Okay, he's about to be burned at the stake and a poor widow, a destitute widow, comes with a bundle of wood and asks, could you put this really close to John Huss? Obviously so that he'll burn more quickly, more horribly, right? And John Huss is there and he's asking, what did I ever do to you that you hate me so much that you're adding fuel to the fire of my martyrdom? She said that John Huss had never personally injured her. Moreover, although wood was scarce and expensive and she was very poor, she had pinched and saved to buy that bundle of wood for a purpose. He was a heretic, she said, and it was a good work to give wood to have him burn. You see what's happening here? A man is being burned for standing up for God's truth over what false teachers are telling people. And a woman thinks she's a Christian and is calling the one who is doing the right thing a heretic and she wants to add fuel to the fire. Conscience said to John Huss, this is what John Huss's conscience told him, give your body to be burned. Conscience said to the widow, give your wood to burn him. Conscience must be educated and monitored by the word of God. In the work of conviction, the Holy Spirit seizes upon conscience and brings God's word to bear upon it with mighty power. How many of you know it's the word of God above your conscience? But the Holy Spirit brings the word of God to bear upon your conscience. Protect your conscience. Submit your conscience to the Holy Spirit. Because as this example demonstrates, and as 1 Timothy 4.2 shows us, people can go tilt and very sincerely then, sincerely lead others to damnation. Isn't that scary? It's very scary. Conscience must be educated and monitored by the word of God. The Holy Spirit seizes upon conscience and brings God's word to bear upon it with mighty power. And this is my last scripture before we pray. And I do want everybody to actively seek the Lord because I know there's a lot that we need to respond to from this message. Hebrews 9, 14, beautiful scripture. Listen to what it says, because it regards the conscience. You've probably heard this scripture before, but think about it in a new way now. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Holy Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. So this is the blood of Christ, Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God on the cross. How much more? And the comparison here is, Hebrews is previously talking about the blood of goats and bulls that was shed throughout all the Old Testament time. All that blood that has been spilled was really pointing to this. All that blood temporarily covered people's guilt. But how much more? Who is thankful today? Will the blood of Christ, who died once and for all, purify our conscience? See that? Purify our conscience 
from dead works that we might serve the living God. That ties it all together, doesn't it? The blood of Christ can right now today, no matter how messed up your conscience has gotten through your own lack of response to the Lord or from your own lack of understanding the role of your conscience, no matter how messed up it has become, your conscience can be purified from dead works, worthless living. It can be purified to actually serve the living God and be in vibrant relationship with him. How many of you want to be able to hear the Holy Spirit speaking through your conscience? And I stand before you telling you that we all, every single day, need to pray to the Lord and say, let your blood just flow through me. Let your blood just, what's 1 John 1, 9 say? If we confess our sins, that's written to Christians, by the way. If we confess our sins, that isn't a salvation verse. How many of you know that? 1 John 1, 9 is not a salvation verse. It's for Christians. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and thereby restore a relationship with him that is close and vital. How many of you ever feel distant from God even though you're a Christian? That, come from, that comes from sin. It comes from a conscience that isn't right before God. But who knows there's hope? The blood of Christ can purify the conscience, give you what you need. I'm asking you very sincerely to take a moment or two before God, to think about what you've learned, to think about your conscience, and to submit it to the word of God. I want you, if you will, to visualize the blood of Jesus coming into your mind. We don't know... You know, that conscience is an unseen thing where exactly it's seated in us. We don't know, but we know that the blood of Jesus can flow all over it. Amen? Dear Lord, we come before you this morning, and I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you, Father, for spelling out these things in the book of Romans. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being a faithful teacher who never gives up on us. We thank you for the warnings that you have presented to us. You only warn us because you love us. And I ask right now that each and every one would take just a few moments and respond to what you've shown us. I can't pray a prayer for anybody. Lord, you know that. But my prayer is that each one from their own heart, of their own volition, would in these moments say, Jesus, let your blood purify my conscience. Dear Lord, give me a conscience that is clear that is good. Dear Lord, give me a conscience that is actively submitting to your word in every area of life. Dear Lord, give me a conscience that I do not ignore, that is never seared or damaged Father, I pray right now that your blood come in and purify and cleanse us in such a way that the damage that has been done by our own sin to our conscience would be taken away and that you sharpen us to hear your voice in every area of life. And one more thing for which I pray is for anyone here or listening who needs the blood of Jesus to come in for the first time ever and regenerate somebody. Give somebody brand new life. Like you know you've never turned honestly to Jesus before. 
And you know this is more than just your conscience being cleared. What you need is you need made into a new creation. You are stuck in sin. You are feeling hopeless and guilty. You don't have an active relationship with God. My friend, that's why he has you listening today. You can. It is the blood of Jesus Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself on the cross 2,000 years ago once and for all to pay for your sin and then he rose from the grave to give you life. Ask Jesus to make you new. His Holy Spirit will come in and he will live in you. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us and what you will continue to do in our lives as we respond to you. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.